There you go. Daisy. All right, this is Daisy, and I've forgotten. I'm spacing on your name again. Um, Help me, Abigail. Abigail. I just worked with a woman named Abigail. You think I can remember that? And then we have Bucky. Bucky. That's your cue. Bucky. Bucky. You want a treat? Bucky's back to being a little bit off uh, Bucky's game. There we go. Bucky. So Bucky, there we go. Uh, is probably, it's, it's been a long time, a long session. This is about four hours in. Normally our sessions only go three hours, but we have a really nice family here, so I'm happy to do an extra hour. Um, all right, so this is uh, Bucky, um, uh, Abigail, and uh, Daisy's Roadmap to Success. Now, um, the Guardian here uh, primarily works with dogs, and so there's a lot of knowledge and stuff that's already available, but uh, we started to really work on a, a more of the dog psychology and uh, the reason and the motivation for the dog to do different things. I'm going to start off with one problem that the family has that we really didn't address in the session, so this is the beginning, so you can use this technique. Uh, there's a dog outside uh, next door that is a dog that these dogs like to bark at. And uh, when they're barking at them, they probably don't listen to guardians. And if your dog is not listening to you and you keep on calling it, you're helping your dog practice or training your dog to ignore your listening to your commands. So I really only say uh, a command three times. I say it once in a normal tone of voice. If that doesn't work, I usually use a high pitch voice. Come! And then the third thing is um, I actually, I don't actually say it. I go over and I get the dog. Now, if the dog's barking and you run, march over there, you're like, your energy is angry, the dog's gonna move away and the dogs are a lot faster than we are. So make sure you purge that of your system. You're just gonna basically very dispassionately go over there, attach the leash to the dog's collar, and then we're going inside. I'm not gonna ask you over and over again, I'm gonna make it happen. Now, that's about as much force as I like to do as a dog uh, psychologist, but sometimes we have to let the dog, and dogs, once they're worked up or animated, we call it aroused, they're not gonna listen to you. And so you just have to help them get out of that situation. But we can also help condition them to come. So one of the things we do, um, we could do it in a whole bunch of different ways, but uh, one of the first ways I would do is a lot of times when we ask our dogs a command, we're actually, it represents the end of fun. The dogs are, all three dogs are outside, they're yelling at the neighbor dog to make sure he doesn't cross the line. You ask the dogs to come, let's say they didn't listen to you, and they came in, you close the door. <sighs> I was having a great time yelling at that dog. I listened to you, came inside, now that you close the door and the fun is over. Next time, I'm just not gonna listen to you, I'm gonna stay out there and bark at the dog, which is probably where we're at now. Sit. That's passive training we'll talk about in a sec. So what I want to do is condition the dogs to come to us consistently, easily. And one of the first ways I do like to do that is through passive training. And uh, I guess you could do it with petting with purpose, but really more passive training. So every time sit, that's passive training. Passive training is waiting for the dog to organically offer you the behavior voluntarily. So what you do is every time one of the dog comes to you, just pet it and say come. Or hear or whatever the word is. Make sure you pick one word and only use that one word. And so now every time the dog comes to you on its own volition, you didn't ask it to, you're petting it and rewarding it. So now it doesn't represent the end of playtime. Most of the time it represents just getting some attention from the human. Coming is a good thing. Uh, if we get a little jockeying, uh, uh, yes. Um, all right, so um, the next stage is when they're outside, there's a lot of distractions and it's a lot of fun. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna shape the behavior without the neighbor dog out there. So I would check with your neighbor ahead of time while you're doing this and call them and just say, hey, we're gonna do a quick exercise outside. You can give us five minutes without letting the dog out. And maybe you bring them a little, some doggy cookies or something like that as a nice, you know, way of explaining we hired this guy and we're gonna try to stop production parking your dog. So when their dog's not in the yard and your dogs are out in the yard, and I would practice this with each dog's one at a time first and then eventually the two best dogs together once they know what they're doing and then all three dogs together. But again, easiest version possible without the other dog present, sit. Um, so what I would do is the more that I ask the dog to do something, the more that I put it in the power position of the driver's seat because I'm asking it to do something. Now some situations it can be a nice way of reinforcing if the dog doesn't have alternatives, but the dog is 12 other alternatives, then you're at the 12th option, you're gonna lose that battle. So what I wanna do is play a little aloof. And you can see that Daisy here is very interested in the treats that I have. So I'd let her see that I have a bunch of these treats. Uh, well, actually I wouldn't let her see because I would do this when they're normally already outside. Let the dogs outside, they're out there doing their thing. They're not barking at the other dog. What I do is I have some of these high value trained treats and treats that have a strong aroma. Dogs smell, the most smell is the most important thing uh, when it comes to food. So a meat based treat, chicken liver works great. Go out in the middle of the yard and have about uh, five of these treats and just wait. Don't command the dogs to come, don't look at them, just walk out there or just stand there. As soon as one dog comes over to you, give it a treat and say, come, and then turn around and walk back in the house. Let's say when we did this first time, we walked 25 paces to get to the middle of the yard. Next time we do this, um, I, I keep on going back to 25 paces until pretty much I go out there and the dogs are running to me. And then when I do that, then I start backtracking. So instead of going 25 paces, I go 24 paces. 
and then 23, 22, 21. I keep on going away until they're all the way, they're on the stairs to the deck, then they're on the deck, then they're by the door. When you get to the door, now that threshold, whoops, if I go across the threshold, well then I lose, you know, the dog loses its authority or its leverage. So sometimes they won't want to come in there. So when you get to the last stage, what I do is I touch the nose of the treat, toss the treat inside, they in go inside to get it, come up with a word that means house or casa or home, a fun word preferably, castle, palace. And then, and then leave the door open and let them go back out and play. So we're not saying every time you come and I ask you to come inside, do you, are you forced to stay outside? So we keep on doing this and the dog goes in and out and after we take away that threshold barrier hesitation and they're just happy to come in and out. And now sometimes they come in and when they do come in, I would give them, uh, get a treat and throw it inside and when they come in, come up with a command word that means go in the house every time they lick it up. And whenever you give a dog a treat, make sure that they hear the command word immediately after the treat goes in their mouth, not before. Where's sweetheart. Oh yes, I'm gonna put you on my lap. Yes, so looks because you're so pretty. Yes, and you're gonna lick me to death. Um, okay, so the idea is we conditioning the dog that listening to us is a positive thing because yes, <laughs> because uh, number one we do it in the house a lot. Every time the dog comes to its own volition. Now right now she's kissing me. I could create a uh, passive training for this. Every time she kisses, say the word uh, kisses or smoochies or whatever you want to say. You're gonna be a wiggle butt, aren't you? Okay, well we'll put you down then. There we go. Um, so basically, the and if she is licking or doing that stuff inappropriate and she's allowed back on the furniture, that's one of the rules we're going to talk about in a minute, then she should lose that privilege. And if you do that within the genesis of that behavior, I let her go on and on. I was kind of holding her and kind of twisting. As soon as she does that, just stand up and you eliminate the lap. She just jumps down. So the first lick causes me to lose the, if you don't want any licks. Or you can, when she licks you, say the word kisses or smooches and create a command word for that so you can create a command word to not do that. Okay, so um, the idea is the dog's gonna be conditioned to come to the door when the other dog's out there. So the next stage, we want, what we wanna do, is, and we're reinforcing it in the house. So the next stage, what we do is maybe have that dog outside in the yard and maybe ask your neighbor if we can handle your dog. So have a friend come over, one of you, and that, have that dog on the leash. And then basically what I would do is, so the dog's not running around and barking, I would let one of your dogs out in the backyard first then your neighbor or somebody lets the dog outside on a leash, and the dog comes over and starts barking at it, then you go out, to, uh, the person goes back in the house, and then you appear, or the other, you have somebody else near the door, and then you kind of step out in the light, and the dog, okay, well, the stimulus is no longer there, I can't really get any attention from there, but I know if I go to the door, I'm gonna get a reward. So I still have a little bit of carry over the excitement from the dog there, but the dog is now left. So we get the dog to come to us and comes inside and we give it a treat, or we might give it a jackpot, give it five treats, because that's harder. The other dog was just out there, it might come back out. But we're helping the dog, I see the dog, and then I immediately go in the house and get a reward. We can do this with free shaping some other ways as well, but I think this is gonna be the best way to do it. So the dog sees the dog, then the dog, only for a second the dog disappears, and I go into the house. So the idea is you keep on repeating that, so your dog looks at the dog, and then it comes in the house and gets a reward. So looking at the dog gets me the reward. Hey buddy, yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, I don't know if he's allowed. Uh, we have a young one uh, just, just starting to walk, and we want to make sure he stays safe because there's some stairs right nearby. Um, now, the other thing you could do is actually teach your dog to look away, and I actually just did a video with this about, a, well, about five hours ago now um, with a dog. Uh, what kind of uh, dog was that? Um, uh, losing my train of thought. Oh, it was a, uh, a blue healer. And, uh, I'm gonna, and the title of it is going to be, I think, uh, using free shaping to teach uh, an ag dog aggressive dog to look away. So when you go to the right up a section of my website, it'll be the one right below this one. That one I did use free shaping to teach the dog to look away from the other dog. And so I can go through that video, but I'm gonna give you just the highlights of it. What we did is we used free shaping. So I sat there in front of the dog with some treats and a clicker. We primed the clicker first. And I just waited. As soon as the dog looks away, look, at first it just looked like this. And I click and then give it a treat. And we said the word voyeur to mean to look away. And then we, and we waited, and then the dog this time turned a little bit more. But you waited, we're not, we're not doing anything to get the dog to, we're just waiting for the dog to organically offer that behavior. This is really operant conditioning. And eventually the dog's pulling, you're asked for more and more criteria. Eventually, every time the dog turns, click, and then I get a treat, and I hear the voyeur. So then the next step, what I do, and what I went through in this video in greater detail, is we arrange a scenario where that dog is close enough to us for my dog to be alert, aware of it, but not to feel it to be a threat. And at that point, what we do is we have a barrier. So that dog appears for a second. We give my dog two seconds to look at it. If it doesn't look up at me on its own, then I say voyeur. It looks up at me, and then I click and give it a treat. And while I'm doing this, the person takes the dog out of sight. It's kind of version of what I was talking about before. So the dog, I look away from the dog, and that dog goes away. Now for dogs, 
Um, probably don't want to lick that, buddy. Uh, he's licking the dog bowl. <laughs> uh, so he's going back in. Uh, so basically, uh, what we're teaching the dog is looking away from the dog is, uh, is a desirable reward of behavior. Now, this is a, called a cutoff signal to dogs. If a dog is approaching me and I turn my head to the side, or if you're approaching a dog and you reach down to, and the dog turns his head to the side, that's your dog's way of, the dog's way of saying, no, I don't want you to touch me. We ignore that. We pet him anyways. Well, some dogs are like, well, I'll nip you because you didn't listen to me. Um, so if you're in the future, if you're going to pet a dog and it turns his head to the side and you retract your arm and wait, that can actually help that dog, oh, wow, he listened to me. I feel more comfortable with this person now. So the idea is we keep on programming this, and so the dog eventually gets programmed. Instead of barking at the other dog, I look away from the other dog. Now, the problem we have here is we have three dogs, and they're going to cascade off of each other. That's why I talked about when we're doing this, we want to do this with one dog at a time and keep on practicing that one dog until every time that dog sees a neighbor dog, it looks, turns away. And at first, the neighbor's dog is only available for a second, but we prolong it. Like I said, I'm not going to go through the details because I went through it detailed in the video below this one uh, or right up below this one on my website, dogonproblems.com. Uh, but basically, the idea is eventually you teach the dog that if you don't like the other dog, just turn your head and look away. And the other, and we're, we're stimulating, we're structuring it where the dog disappears once they look away. And so after we program it enough, that's just normal behavior. The dog's doing something I don't like, I turn away. That was a good sit. Um, now, the other dog's not going to always go away, and you can extrapolate this by having the dog walk one or two, three steps out, and as soon as the dog looks away, it goes back in the house. And so eventually, your dog thinks, if I look away from that dog, it causes that dog to go inside. Now, after we've done it enough, it's not going to always cause the dog to go inside, but it helps the dog practice, and that's a new behavior. See the other dog? I look away from it. And that can mitigate a lot of problems. And also, teaching your dog a strong recall to come in also helps with that. So we're kind of tackling the problem with multiple angles. Okay, now in the video above this one, we talked about uh, structure feeding and how to teach your dog to leave the room. So I'm not going to talk about those two things, but those are very important. Some of the other things we talked about is I found the problem with most dog behavior issues are, number one, that humans are not communicating sit in a way the dog understands. And number two, even if it understands it, it's not motivated to listen because it doesn't respect the means as an authority figure. So what I do instead is I uh, want to make sure that the dogs clearly understand what's going on, and then I want to flip the leader-follower dynamic so they see us as the authority figure. Because we nurture them, we're there for them, we add structure and discipline, not punishment, but discipline, and help them develop new skills, and so they respect us as an authority figure, and they're more inclined to want to listen to us. So the first way I flip the leader-follower dynamic is by incorporating rules and structure. Um, and so some of the rules that I incorporated were not being allowed to be on this carpet in this room when we're eating, humans are eating food. And we would use that out command or off command uh, first, and then what I showed you in the kitchen, if you use those escalating consequences. Another rule would be that humans have to eat before the dogs eat. Another rule is dogs are not allowed to be in the kitchen when they're preparing food, not around sit, uh, not around the uh, dining room table when we're eating food, not going out the door first, not, I can't pet for that for sure, uh, not going up and down stairs first, uh, for dogs whoever's in front is perceived as a leader. So we want to teach the dog to have some boundaries, and not because there's a barrier, but because you have clearly communicated this is the boundary I'm not supposed to cross during this particular behavior or scenario. Okay, she's a beagle, so she can be barking, so I'll take the whining, that's better. Um, all right, so um, another rule would be uh, that the dog has to sit before we let the good job. Guardian just corrected, she, was, she likes to hump. Not all males are the humpers. Um, and also, if you teach the other dogs to do a circle or a hurricane, that's a wonderful way to get, teach the other dog, well, if I just circle when, every time I get mounted, I've had a ton of dogs get mounted at the dog park. Once they teach them to circle, after a while, you, at first you trigger it, and then after a while, you just say circle, and the dog just does a circle. The dog tries to hump two or three times, and says, well, this doesn't work, and they find somebody else. Now in this case, it's the female, the, uh, the oldest female that's trying to dominate uh, one of the younger dogs, I guess next in line, but we just don't want to allow that. Anything your dog is doing in your presence that you don't specifically disagree with as far as the dog's concerned, you are giving it thumbs up. So that was awesome. Remember, you have three seconds to correct reward. so what the Guardian did there was beautiful. Um, okay, so the other thing we want to do, uh, other rules, we, uh, like the door I was talking about, you go to the door and say, sit once. If the dog doesn't sit within three seconds, I walk away. I wait one minute, then I go back to the door and tell the dog again to sit. If it doesn't sit, I walk away for two minutes, next time for four minutes, then for eight minutes. I keep double the length of time. You don't want to go outside, your dog does. And as soon as your dog sits, you open that door like there's no control in their butt. After a while, the dog will go to sit at the door as its way of indicating I would like to go outside. Um, I would also, uh, let me see, here. Uh, use the command to get the dogs to go to the dog bed by tossing the treats on, like I mentioned. Uh, that's not so much a rule, but... Uh, when we take away the furniture, these are, they already like their dog beds, but they don't like them even more, and assign a command word sit to each dog, work, uh, dog bed. Remember, come up with funny command words, Jamaica, 
you know, St. Bart's, uh, Virgin Islands, or whatever you want to call it. Try to come up with one word commands. Now, there's, uh, this is a split oval house, and there's a nice, beautiful bay windows in the front that look down onto the street. And one of the dogs, who Daisy, who's just here, loves to bark at people. And every time she barks at people and they're coming close and they move away, she thinks she defended the house. So one of the things we do in the behavior world is we, we call it maintenance. We want to create a scenario where the dog it doesn't have temptation or is nothing that's going to trigger a behavior. So I would recommend maybe about two feet of just white paper on the outside of the house. And so that way it visually looks nice. It's just really a filter if sunlight hits. The rest of the uh, window can be open so we can see in and out, but the dogs from their perspective, they can't see out. So every time she goes to the window, she can't see out so she won't get rewarded for barking and thinking she made people move away. Now there's a little ledge behind the couch and I would recommend just taping uh, down some uh, tin foil there. Uh, dogs don't like the sights, uh, taste, or texture of tin foil, and so usually that will keep them off. And then I would get some X mats for the uh, furniture because one of the rules is now on the furniture. And again, all these rules should be 30 days or until the problem is abated completely. And then with an invitation per time because that way we're in control of the resource. So no furniture. And I teach the dog to get off the furniture the same way we do out. Just toss, touch the nose of the treat, throw it on the ground. They jumped out to get it. We say the word off. And then I grab the X mats and put it back on, that t on the cushion to, as a safe space holder. And eventually the dogs will not do that. And if you do end up taking one of these out to wash it, don't put it on the couch because I just found out today watching my security game, my dog jumped on the couch when they don't do it anymore. We don't have to practice it under any capacity. That's confusing, which we talked about at the very beginning of the session. Uh, let me see. Um, so those are some examples of rules. There's probably a couple others that I'm forgetting, but remember to message me or t call me if you have any questions. I, I'm here for you, but I only can help you if you let me know you need help. Now we also talked about, uh, yeah, well, we're still got a ways to go. Um, uh, we still have, we also talked about structure. And a great way to do structure, there's an old technique they used to call it uh, no free lunch. I call it petting with a purpose. I've added to it a little bit. The dog comes and nudges me or paws at me or barks at me for attention. I pet it. I'm validating, yes, when you tell me what to do, I jump. And that tells the dog that it's a leader. Plus, it's telling me, so it's thinking like a leader. So next time the dog nudges you, instead of actually petting the dog, tell the dog to sit. When it sits, pet it on its chin, say the word sit, and only the word sit. It's already sitting, ask it to sit over here or ask it to lay down. Has it do something to change its state in order to get that affection? Doesn't work on babies though. Um, and so after a while, what will happen is the dog will come start sitting in front of you to prepay for attention. That's a big shift in the leader follow dynamic. If I'm telling you what to do, I'm, I'm an order, uh, I'm a leader. If I'm, come. If I'm asking you, that's a follow. And so sitting is a more subordinate position as well. So the dog starts coming and sitting in front of you, prepaying, sit. Make sure you do recognize that, otherwise they will go back nudging you or pawing it. And after a while, uh, the dog re realizes if I tell the humans what to do, not, they don't do anything. But if they tell me what to do and I do it, I get hooked up. So that's the beginning of structure and motivating for the dog to want to do what we want them to do. Um, now, uh, make sure you do recognize that and come up with a word if you're missing an opportunity to pet with, uh, with a purpose. Um, now, even if you want to pet the dog, still ask the dog to do something before you pet it so that it feels like you're just re earning that reward. Um, here, sweetheart. Can I pick you up and put you on my lap? We'll see. Yes. Oh, look at who's a sweetheart. Daisy is a sweetheart. Yes, you are. Oh, it's the yellow growly. We don't ever correct dogs for growl because she's saying, hey, I got this human. Uh, now, I can kind of adjust things a little bit. There we go. And I don't want to restrain her because that can create more uh, of a problem. So she was kind of a little bit jealous. This is my lap, and now you're coming. But she's like, well, I want to give me that lap action too. I was up there for a minute. I was going to lick him like there's no tomorrow. So again, that... I let her get down so she feels like she can do it herself. But if you do have a dog that growls, make sure you don't ever correct them for growling. Increase the distance or get your dog out of that situation so they don't have to take it to the next step. Okay, so um, I also use passive training. Passive training is what I'll do right here. Come. I didn't ask her to come. I didn't show her a retreat. She just came on her own. Oh, volition. I don't know if you see that. She was trying to mount. Um, and sit. So now she's doing behavior that I like. And for her, she likes to do this. This is a dominance move. I think she's also confused about shaking. So what I do is I pet her. I stop petting her as soon as that arm comes up. I don't know if you can see this on camera. Can you see it? You don't, have to adjust, you don't have to adjust it if it's not there. Okay. So basically, every time I reach for the pet, as soon as the paw comes up, I stop reaching. And so after a while, the dog learns, if I keep my paws on the ground, you'll pet me? Cool. I'll, that's the deal. I'll leave them down there. Uh, but this is, again, confusing for the dog. So, um, all right. So for passive training, you can do it for anything the dog does. Every toy should be named something. Sit. Um, and any behavior, especially things that are unusual. I taught one of my dogs to stretch this way. Every time we stretch, I pet him and say stretch, because stretch puts him into a play bow, and that helps me help other dogs. If my dog is nervous, and I put my dog in a play bow, it makes the other dog feel more relaxed. 
So there's a great book called uh, uh, Calming Signals by an author, and I think it's pronounced Turid Ragash. She's like from Scandinavia somewhere. But she noticed that her dog can actually have a positive impact on and calm other dogs down. And she started studying all the things they do, and one of the things they do is they turn their head and yawn. Um, things along those lines. Lifting the, this could be like a way of saying you can approach me. We're knowing what to recognize can really help you if you have a dog with behavior problems, being able to read your dog's tail or how it's moving and so on and so forth. Okay, so for passive training, every time your dog does things you like, come, make sure you pet them. They go to the dog bed, this is Jamaica, this is whatever, this is whatever, every time they go there, say the command word. Um, after a while, your dog will start offering those behaviors because now you're only petting me when I do those behaviors voluntarily or you give me a command and I do them. That's the best way to get your attention. Most of us train our dogs to misbehave because that's when they steal remote control or the water bottle, that's where we get up and correct them. Well, then we train them to actually do the things we don't want to get our attention. For good dogs, good attention, bad attention, pretty much the same thing. So if we're rewarding, if the dog steals remote control, we get up and chase it or it comes and sits in front of us, we ignore it, they're going to steal your remote control. So just start rewarding set to your dogs for the things that you want and they'll start finding, she's a smarty pants. Um, so make sure you're training her because that'll help. Uh, and train, try to train them all. I'd like to see the guardians, I usually recommend that the guardians take turns. Week, uh, guardian A, one week, teaches the dog one trick, an easy one, and go to YouTube. All these dog trainers have the, trick, uh, the methods up there for free. I gotta stop. So if she jumps up, I freeze, and I stop engaging with her. I normally wouldn't be talking if I'm not oh. going up. Off. So when I jump up on the human, it causes them to freeze. This is a version of the very first thing I got here. I, I, I remember to do the leash uh, jumping exercise. And I have, if you want to search for that on my website, search for honey jumping. It's probably the best video I've done on that. Uh, but it will explain all the ins and outs of that. Make sure you only do it when people are excited, when the dogs are excited. Um, okay, so uh, the more that we reward them for the desired actions and behaviors, the more they're going to continue to offer those. And then and think that I have to ask for things versus, versus tell something. That water. Okay. It sounded like so we're eating something wet. Um, okay. Um, anything else? I, I went over the four escalating consequences. Remember to hiss before the dog does the wrong thing and match the intensity of your hiss to the dog's energy. Once they cross the threshold, then you stand up abruptly, turn to face the dog, and keep that dog in front of you without moving your, your feet. Keep your hip and, sh uh, and shoulders tracking the dog. Your authority goes whatever direction your belly button is pointing. As soon as the dog stops moving, take two steps backwards and only two steps. And then pause for one second to say that's the end of the sentence. The third consequence is to march deliberately at the dog until the dog turns sideways or greater away from you. At that point, you stop and you go to the second consequence. Now you're pivoting. Dog stationary. Take two steps back. Pause for one second. Go back to doing what you're doing. Unless the dog is already in a do not uh, be uh, do, uh, in designated do not uh, area they're not supposed to be in. So then I would march deliberately at the dog until I get to the edge of it, and this is how we enforce an invisible boundary. The fourth consequence is to uh, put the dog on a leash and give it a leash timeout. If you forget how to do all those, I have videos for that on my website or just message me and I'm happy to go over that with you. All right, um, exercise is one last thing. Uh, really, we talked about one of the first things. Um, dogs, you need about an hour's worth of exercise a day. Higher energy breeds might need more than, or do need more than that. Daisy is probably the highest energy dog uh, here. So before we practice the exercise I showed about the, you know, getting the dog to turn away or the recall or whatever it is, we want to deplete her excess energy first. Playing fetch, the laser, as long as it's healthy. Some dogs, the laser is not healthy. I always make sure, a good point, because I see some people do it and their dogs are neurotic, and that's not. If your dog starts breathing really heavy and getting really panicky, that your dog's not for it. If it's chasing it in a healthy way, uh, interested but not, like, looks like they're jonesing for drugs, that's probably okay. If you're not sure, probably just don't do the laser. Uh, but other ones, we went over uh, using the stairs to get to condition the dogs to go up and down the stairs. Fetch is a wonderful way to exercise them. And one of the other ones that I do is what I call, uh, I just call it scent games. You just Google scent games, S-C-E-N-T. Come. I love her. She's a little bow-legged. She almost looks like a rodeo dog. Uh, but uh, uh, anytime the dog uses their brain, that causes them to, uh, that's very mentally draining for them. And so, again, what I'm doing here is just saying I'm, you become very uninteresting to me when you jump up. Now, I think at this point, she's a little frustrated because it's been four hours, and they just ate dinner, and she's like, you've been in my house for too long. Cut me or get the heck out. So this is probably a good time. And yeah, time. our tea man over there is also saying, it's time to wrap it up, buddy. I, got, I need some mommy time. So, uh, well, this is Daisy, and we have uh, Abigail, uh, finally got it going, and uh, Bucky uh, somewhere else. Oh, if she tries to do this, some people think that she's trying to give you a hug. She was about to try to hump my leg. So she's trying to assert herself. She is trying to run the show. So is this normal for her? The guardian's looking very unnerved. I've done sessions where like one dog is like the dominant dog 
And then all of a sudden, as soon as we provide structure and discipline, dog doesn't know how to behave and like freaks out. Is is Bucky kind of more the dominant dog? I don't think so. Okay, because uh, Bucky kind of never seen her mount a person. Okay. Ever. Well, but I'm in here bossing people around, bossing the dogs around. She's like, well, if I can dominate him, then I assume that top spot. So again, I don't take it personally, but I'm going to disagree immediately. Uh, and she's probably a little bit out of sorts because she's used to. You know, she thinks the balance is right and she's comfortable with the way it is and suddenly now there's all these new things going on so I have to kind of assert myself. And there will be ebbs and flows. After a while, something is just going to stop working. The dog's going to go back to the old way. If it does, I get a lot of panic call, phone calls, just stay the course. The dog remembered. Oh, I remember. I used to jump up and nudge them and they petted me. Let's go back to that. That was good. It doesn't work anymore. So just be consistent. Remember, inconsistency is confusing to a dog. Uh, all right, Daisy. Come here, sweetheart. Yes, come here, sweetheart. Yes. Oh, yes. Let me support you. This is Daisy. Yes. And she's a lover. Oh, yes. I'll make sure you're safe. And uh, this and uh, uh, Abigail and Bucky are around here somewhere. And this is their roadmap to success. Daisy wants me to remind you, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it. Right, Daisy? Oh. That's right. 